So to set up the searches in FBO by keyword, and the reason why we do that, uh, you know, you've already got searches set up in there by NAX codes, but let me show you why it's better to do them by keyword. If we go to the Federal Procurement Data System. You're going to see that some awards are done under the right NAX codes and some awards are done under the wrong codes. Um, yep. Popcorn for consumer goods. Um, but it also comes up under construction, comes up under uh, food production machinery, even though they might not be buying production yep. machinery, they might be actually buying popcorn. So it's up to the purchasing agent what uh, NAX codes they think they should use, and they can't get in trouble for using the wrong one. Uh, so if they do use the wrong one, it's no big deal, except that you might not get it because you were searching by the actual code itself, and you weren't looking for the wrong codes. But if you All do right. the search by, by keyword, every opportunity has a description in it, and those keywords are in the description. So if you do it All by right. keyword, uh, you can be more specific. Uh, whereas NAX codes are going to be bringing you a lot of stuff that's not a good fit because it was the wrong code. So to set up the keyword searches, you simply log into FBO. They're actually really easy to do. Go to your FBO and log in. You can log in on the home page by going to home and scrolling down to the green box right here, Vendor Citizens. Put in your username and password. Would it be crazy if I didn't know what my username and password is? No, uh, your FBO was set up by your case manager and they emailed you the user ID and password, but that email might have gone into your bulk spam or junk filter. So just email me after the training's over and I'll search it and, and email it to you. All right, no problem. So you log in, you're going to know you're logged in because it's going to say welcome, it's going to have your name here. And you go okay. over here to where it says save searches. Click on that. Yep. I have searches set up because I've uh, used these to teach people how to do it. Um, you're probably only going to have one that's going to say next, national or something like that. Just scroll down to where you see add new search agent. Click on it. And the first thing you do is you're going to name it. Now, if you're just going to name this search a one keyword name, all you do is name it whatever the keyword is. So if you're going to do it under um, asphalt, copy the word. If you want it to search all, everywhere, leave the states blank. If you only want it to search a certain state, click that state. If you want it to search oh. multiple states, hold down the control button, CTRL button, and you click as many states as you want, and it'll highlight them all. If you don't hold down the CTR button, every time you click one state, it's going to unhighlight the last state. And oh, like I, I said, if you want, it, you want it to search them all, just leave it blank. Copy the oh. keyword. And scroll down to the saw, the keyword or saw box, and paste it. And that's it. Don't pick any codes. Don't click on any boxes. Just name it or label it. And then paste that word in the keyword box. And then scroll to the bottom, save and schedule, and then yes, enable it, and then save it. And that's it. That search was set up. It'll run automatically every day from now on. So that'll that'll search everything to do with asphalt. Everything, everything. Asphalt machinery, asphalt services, asphalt repair, uh, fixing uh, salt creep or or freeze cracks, whatever. Now, that's a pretty vague search. So yes, it's going to get us some stuff that's not a good fit. We don't sell all asphalt manufacturing equipment. We don't sell hot milk machines, you know, those things that we don't do, they're going to come up under that keyword. So, in order to alleviate that, I have some searches, I call them FBO cheats, that I can send you. 
uh, we can set up more specific searches, and those are like this. So we can set them up with quotes and in capital and in between, or capital okay. nots, or capital ors, and you can be more specific. So to do one of those searches, You would go to the search agent page, click Add New. Yep. And we're going to do what? Give me a two keyword search. Give me an example. Diesel engines. One more time. On. Diesel and engines. Eagle, E A G L E. No, diesel. Diesel. All right, put the photo. D I E S C L. Okay, so diesel. We're going to put a quote. It's not a quote. There's a quote. Diesel, capital and engine. Close quote. Copy. <laughs> Scroll down and paste. Scroll down and save and schedule. Yes, enable, and save. Okay. It's going to run automatically every day from now on. You don't have to do anything. You just check your email. You're going to get an email from noreply.fail.gov automatically. All right, I got you. And if you've got a search like asphalt that's too, too vague, then we can always go back in later and add what this is called Boolean logic, uh, adding the ands and the nots and the ors and stuff like that. We can add the Boolean logic later and make it more specific. All right. Okay. I got yep. There's also a list of acronyms on here that I've found since I started here in 2009. Every federal acronym. I'm going to email you this email so you've got it, and I'll send it to everybody else on the training. Yep. Okay. I had a client ask me earlier today, she said, uh, you know, I've watched a lot of your videos on YouTube and I've watched some of your stuff on Google and I've seen some of your articles on LinkedIn. But she says, I, I want to see all of them. I want to see everything you've got. Is there one place where you have everything? And uh, there wasn't. So I went ahead and created one. <laughs> uh, for anyone who's interested in seeing everything about me that exists on the Internet, go to my LinkedIn. And right here, where it looks at me, it looks like I'm peeking over a wall. It's like I'm neighbor, Tim's neighbor. Uh, click on it. And I went in and I posted every bit of media, uh, articles, brochures, flyers, uh, my presentations, any, any articles that mention me or a conversation that they mention me, that's all on one page. And you can literally go through them one at a time if you want or go through and pick the ones that you haven't read yet. It's all right here in one spot. All right. And of course, if you're not following me on LinkedIn, go ahead and follow me on LinkedIn. Connect with me on YouTube so you get my new articles as they're posted. All right. Any other questions on setting up your searches? No, I should Anybody else have that. any questions? Anybody else have any questions about setting up searches in FBO? Anybody else have any questions about anything? Or does somebody yeah. have a bid they want to work on? Yes. Yeah, hi, John. Hi, John. This is Monica Hahn's uh, partner. Yes. A couple questions. One is uh, the earned value report. I mean, is that basically a contract? What is it? Is it the earned value report? I mean, is that actually just a contract? 
Um, you know, I'd like to think I know everything, but that's that's first time I've ever heard of it. You said earned value, value report. report. That was in uh, one of the. I was following one of the uh, proposals. I'll, I'll call it from uh, um, on the contract. Or no, that's another question I had. Uh, just on something that was sent to the website, and it was uh, you know from the Navy on uh, a job, and it was like the specifications of the job. Okay, I, I know what you mean. I, I know what EVM is. That's earned value management. That's that's the way that you're going to manage the project uh, to make sure that the you know the value is there. Uh, an earned value report is going to be at some point in time during that report. They want you to or doing that. Uh, that contract, they want you to send a report showing that you are following the EDM. Okay, all right, all right, I got you. Okay, so, uh, so, well, here, here's some of the questions I have. Um, what is the NECO, NECO? NECO is the Navy's database. Um, okay. And the FBO? FBO is the government database where NECO and ASPE and and. Uh, um, FedBid and FedConnect and it, it, all your major military. So Navy has NAVCO uh, or NECO, sorry. Um, the Army has ASPE. Uh, the Marines, the Air Force, they all have their own database. But most of okay. the opportunities, pretty much all the opportunities that are put out go through FBO first. Okay. And then yeah. FBO, so, I mean, we'll, FBO will force you to go to one of those databases if that's where the solicitation is actually being processed is through the database. Yeah. I think that what I was reading was uh, something for the Marines, the Navy. Uh, you know, it was given like all the branches, and uh, you know, it was lengthy, man. And let me tell you, it was several hundred pages. So I, I was, I was just going over a bit. In fact, the of uh, the uh, the NAV fact, the specification for design on this particular one was one thousand fifty three pages. Anyway, what's, what's the product? Uh, uh, well, I, I was hard. Well, I'm in the roofing game, so this this part of it was some sort of construction. But I mean, it was okay. hard to be well, the cipher because I didn't read the I, whole thing. And yeah, I can tell you, whole, most solicitations, eighty to ninety percent of the paperwork in most solicitations, you don't have to read. Most solicitations, okay. eighty to ninety percent of the documentation is your reps and search, which we process for you. You don't have to do manually. All you have to do is download a copy and include it. Okay. Now I, I, I understand about the insurance. Uh, I understand about the insurance. Uh, that was pretty spelled out. The the dollar amounts. Uh, uh, proof of citizenship. I mean, you actually have to bring uh, everyone. The manpower has to submit uh, proof of U.S. citizenship. Um, not usually. I mean, it, this this sounds like a larger contract. I mean, if you're talking about doing construction on a nuclear power plant, yeah, they want to know every single person that's going to step foot on that that property and and who they are, and and you know, you're going to have to pass security clearances and everything else. I deal with well, that a lot more on armed uh, guard contracts versus unarmed guard contracts. They don't typically require that kind of stuff. Okay. All right. Well, I mean, the dollar amount was up to ninety nine million dollars. Uh, what was uh, it? What was the start amount? Uh, I think two million. Hmm. That's kind of a wide range. I mean, usually, usually the ranges are pretty tight. They're between two and a half to five million or something like that, which, which is you know, which is acceptable. It's it's understandable. When they say it's well, going mean, to be anywhere this, between. This was the they total it, of all the contracts put together. Was up up to ninety nine million. I mean that. But you, maybe one contract was only uh, two million eight hundred thousand. But I'm just saying, yeah. whatever, whatever they were, you know, wanting me to know was that this particular thing was up to ninety nine million dollars. Gotcha. Um, did you anyway, want to take a look yeah. at it? Did you want to give me the solicitation number and we'll take a look at it? Or sure. Um, yeah. Hang on. Excuse me. Where was it? I just had it in my hand. I think it was this one. Yeah, it was this one. Uh, there would be the, oh, is that the SOL number? You have something in writing, you want to email it to me? Uh, yeah, I can email it to you. Uh, okay. I, I emailed you two yesterday. This oh, you did? Okay, what email did you send it from? 
uh, mchtkt at me.com. I think I think I was reading, a, you know, a solicitation. Yeah. In fact, it was the second solicita solicitation. Did you say NCH like uh, November Charlie oh, Hotel? No, uh, Amazon uh, Mary. Charlie Hotel. And then TKT at me. And that'd be Tom's. Hi, Tom. That's it. I just forward you the one that he was talking about. All right, yeah, so the the Y roofing I, I highlighted. Um you go down you go down a little bit. Um, I don't think that's this either. Uh you already passed it. It was on the the last page. Well, which part? Oh, uh, oh. All right. Well, so let's look at solicitation two on the right. Uh, October 13th. It was highlighted in blue. Uh, yeah, uh, solicitation two. See solicitation. All right, and then I went down to the second one in line items. I opened up the uh, file for the uh, the second one down. Yeah. Okay, and that that came up, and I started to read, and then got lost. A table of contents, I just passed up. I was just kind of trying to brief myself on what they were doing. Uh, so this is the first one. It looks like it's nine to fifteen pages, and there's there's just many behind it. They talked about the use of the badges, the parking, the speed limits. Uh, yep. Uh, yep. All kinds of stuff. Yeah. Looks like this is going to be at a VA. Um, so unfortunately, you know, when you're doing construction in the VA, you're, you're going to have to follow all these rules. So yeah, well, I mean, that's no pro that's no problem uh, following those rules. I mean, okay. I, that doesn't seem to be an issue. It's just have to learn exactly what those rules are. And, and then if you go down further, there's, then there's a, like that's page five, I think, of fifteen. And then there'll be another. It looks like there's another uh, uh, opportunity. Uh, I'll just say that for lack of words. Another opportunity, and it gives a whole different, almost like it's a different uh, 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 branch of the service. That's Moiling Air Force Base. Uh, you know, so, I mean, that makes a lot of sense, the speed limits and telling you, you know, what you have to do and, and cannot do. I mean, I understand that. Yeah. Where's this locator, does it say? Do well, you know yeah, it says, located? yeah, Moiling Air Force Base. Okay, well, where is that? Well, yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't any, yeah, I don't. any uh, usually at the bottom down here, it'll say contracting office. It'll say uh, location uh, and point of contact. It doesn't say here. It usually specifies. I don't know if we'll narrow after this Florida and Carolina and Georgia that we put on our FBO or what the spread is of where we can and can't go. I 
Now, I think we got that one out of those four. I got that one yesterday at 544. That was after I think I talked to you. I got one Saturday and one yesterday. I think the one Saturday and the one yesterday I sent you. Yeah, this is a multi, uh, they're, they're doing multiple services here. That's why this one's so detailed as well. Ah. What, what was the question on this one? Uh, oh, I, uh, he just walked out of his other phone ring. <laughs> okay. Um, I, you know, he had some questions for me, but I can't read, um, I don't know what it was um, that he needed to know. Um, if if you want to, can we go to the other two that are, seem less complicated? Because like I say, we have never, these are the first four we've ever got. Okay. And uh, I think I said, I think two yesterday. Um, I think one of them was. Oh, um, skylight? Yeah, and one on a building, Z building, three canopies or something like that. What questions did you have on this one? Well, I've never done a proposal or had anything come to me. Uh, I don't know where to go next. I don't know what the next gotcha. step is once it's been sent to me. Gotcha. The two things you're looking for on a solicitation. The first thing you look for is the response date. Make sure you got plenty of time to respond. Make sure it's set aside for something you – go ahead. No, I, I, was, I was listening. I was saying December 13th. Yeah, yeah, the response date. Make sure you look for the response date. Make sure you look for what it's set aside for. Because if it's set aside for something you don't qualify for, you don't want to waste your time on it, okay? If mm -hmm. uh, if it's got plenty of time to respond and it's something you're set aside for, then you read the synopsis. Synopsis is going to give us some a lot of repeat information. It's going to also give us some basic information about what it is they want to buy. Uh, construction, metal canopy over the walkway for handicap entrance, building three. Blah, blah, blah. So the first thing we're looking for is what's called the SOW, the scope of work or the statement of work. If they uh -huh. don't have a scope of work or a statement of work, they're going to have what's called a, P, uh, a PSW or something like that, a performance work statement, a PWS or performance statement of work. <clears throat> it's almost always going to have the word performance in it, and it'll always have the word work in it. That tells us exactly what it is they want to buy. Okay. okay. Read that. So they want metal canopy over uh, walkways, what they're asking for. Right, that was right here in the in the basic uh, in the basic synopsis, so we know that. Um, but the SOW, the scope of work or the statement of work, is going to give us the more detailed description that it needs to be a 20 degree angle, seven feet over extending, blah blah blah. And we scroll okay. down. Blah blah blah. Service disabled veteran, roofing number, small business. Okay. So we're definitely interested. The first thing we're going to do if we're interested and we got plenty of time to bid and it's something that uh, we qualify for, we're going to click watch the opportunity so it puts it on our watch list. If it's on our watch list, it's easy to keep track of because we can always go here. If we keep we lose track of it, we can always go to my FBO and go to our watch list. that will actually oh, be that, on our watch list. Did, our, so it's real, yeah, did, you, did you just put it on the watch list or that's only if we decide to do it or take, get a bid on it? No, you could you put it on your watch list if you're just curious or if you want to know who it's okay. awarded to. or If you find an opportunity that you don't want to bid on but you want to be notified who it's awarded to so you can sell to them or offer to do business with them as a subcontractor, you put it on your watch list so that you're watching it and then you'll be notified when it's modified or awarded. And now is that it right there or that first one or is that something different? It's right there. Canning, uh, yeah. Yeah. So it's on my watch list now. I can also add myself to the interested vendors list, but the interested vendors list is not a blind list. It's a public list, whereas the watch list is a private list. Only the purchasing agent can see. I add myself okay, to so the interested the vendors list. I'm sorry? What's the advantage of being on the um, uh, interested that's, that's vendors list? That's what I was just explaining. If I put okay. myself on the watch list, that's a blind list. Only the purchasing agent can view it. If I put myself on the interested vendors list, that's a public list, and everybody can view it by clicking on it. Got it. Now there's ten. 
There's 10 people on the interested vendors list right now, but that doesn't mean there's 10 bidders. Just because they're on here doesn't mean they're bidding. These guys, Construction Journal, they sell services to construction companies. They sell how to, uh, you know, manage a, a con how to manage a project, but they don't actually manage projects themselves. They sell software to help you manage your projects. So they're not on here to bid. They're on here because they want to be notified who it's awarded to, so they can sell you their stuff. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Folkman, not sure. McDermott, not sure. Uh, the construction company, they're a construction company, they're a contractor. These guys sell software. So they're not on here because they want to bid. They're on here because they want to be notified to sell you their software. That's me. I just put myself on there. And uh, these guys may be competing. They may not. Just because everybody's on here doesn't mean they're bidding. They could be on here because they also want to be notified when it's awarded so they can offer to do work as a sub. All right, so let's let's say that, let's say it's awarded and, and they find out now. Are they going to uh, uh, just continue uh, soliciting uh, for the business that contractor or that awardee? They may. I mean, that's that's up to the awardee. If if they're awarded it and they want to reach out and find subs, then they'll do that. Uh, and they may they may contact people off the interested vendors list. They may not. Uh, okay. I just that's you why I, that I get tons of calls from uh, you know people that want to uh, finance me, give me money, uh, sell me this, sell me that, when they know I'm doing a job in a certain area, city, or whatever. And I'm just sometimes these calls are uh, uh, you know they're they're trying to sell me stuff, and I get maybe a ten of them a day at a time. So I just wondered if yeah. this was going to be the same scenario. Well, you're in SAM, and SAM is a public database. So if you put yourself okay. on this interested vendors list, yes, that's a public database. And the more public databases you put yourself on, the more people that are going to mine them or fish them and get your contact information and call you to sell you stuff. All right, that that's why. I, that's why I say put yourself on the watch list, not necessarily the interested vendors list. Ah, okay, gotcha. Uh -huh. Good. So that's a, that's an avenue of uh, of. Uh, can you go back to my email and uh, the um, scope? Let me of let me long? let me finish let me finish this one first. Oh. Um, it, because this isn't a solicitation. This is a pre-solicitation. So if you're interested in this, you know you got time. You know it's something you're set aside for. We read the synopsis. We put ourselves on the watch list. But we haven't uh, followed the instructions yet because it's a pre-solicitation. We don't know what the purchasing agent wants us to do. We don't know if they want us to just put ourselves on the watch list or the interested vendors list or if they want us to reach out to them and let them know we're interested, if they want us to send them our cap statement, if they want us to come to a site visit. We need to find all that out because it's a pre-solicitation. If the site visit's next week and we don't make the site visit and it was mandatory, when it turns into a solicitation the week after that, we can't even bid on it because we missed part of the instructions to begin with. So what we're looking for now, we got the, the SOW, the statement of work or the performance work statement. We know what it is they want to buy. Now we want to know how they want us to communicate, how they want us to submit our materials or our quote or, or follow-up. So now what we're looking for, what's called instructions to offerer. Offerer, OFA. Oh, okay, gotcha. Offerer, okay, got it. Offerer is, is not a real word. The government made it up. Every time you use it, your spell check is going to tell you it's misspelled because it's actually not a real word. But we're going to open that document. We're going to click outside the document and do a control F and open a search window. And we're going to put in the word instructions so that we're not reading this 60-something page document. We're just looking for the areas we need to read. Okay, it didn't find the word instructions. It's possible uh -huh. it's not on here. Uh, it's also possible this is only a three-page document, so it's not going to be on here. So we're going to cancel that since it's only three pages. The general info we already looked at. This is the same information they gave us on the synopsis in the actual solicitation. Mm -hmm. 
That's the scope of work, which they've already showed us. That tells you what they're asking for. Now, and I see amendments, too. So they can amend these, and we have to be up to date on those amendments, obviously. Yeah, I mean, you have to be up to date on the amendments, and you're also going to have to notify them that you uh, you agree uh, that, that you've read all the amendments. So you're either going to have to uh, do an acknowledgment page along with your bid, or they're going to have an acknowledgment page on the standard form where it's a section where it allows you to put in each of the amendments and the amendment, amendment date, and then you sign it saying you acknowledge all the amendments. Um, okay. They're not getting... They're not giving us any instructions in here on how, how they want us to follow up, being the fact that this is a a, uh, a pre-solicitation, not a solicitation. So I'm going to go back. There's no other attachments. Go to the packages page. There's no additional attachments on the packages page. We've already read that one. Back to notice details. We're going to scroll to the very bottom and see if there's any attachments at the bottom. There's only one. We've already read it. Actually, that's taking us to the vendor portal. And that's the same three-page document we've already read. So in this case, yeah. I'm sorry? Yeah, I see. I see what you did. OK. So in this case, they're not telling us how they want us to respond to this pre-solicitation. So the only thing we can do is either A, go ahead and put ourselves on the interested vendors list and put ourselves on the watch list. We can also B, scroll to the bottom and email the purchasing agent right here. And copy this information right here. Regarding Something short like that, notice of expressed interest, and always say thanks because you're dealing with humans. They don't get a whole lot of of uh, okay. encouragement, and you know, you just you just try use positive words like thanks, and and you know, be thankful because they these guys don't get a lot of appreciation. You know, um, try and word your word your stuff in a positive way. Uh, I had a guy who a uh, client he emailed the purchasing agent and asked him if. He said there was an opportunity in the system that looked like it was it was uh, old, but it hadn't been archived. And instead of uh, asking them if the opportunity was still an open opportunity, he didn't phrase it that way. He said, "Did you forget to archive it?" Which to him didn't sound like an insult. He's you know, like, "Hey, I'm a New Yorker. That's just how we talk." But in the, you're not dealing with New Yorkers all the time. This is a purchasing agent. He could be a southerner or or a minority or a woman. Who knows? Um, so, yeah. you, you know, you don't say, did you forget to archive this? That's an insult. You just basically oh, accuse yeah. them of being stupid or not knowing how to do his job. Ask it in a positive way. Is this still an open opportunity? Not, did you forget yeah. to archive? You know, use, use your words in a positive way and you, you'll get a lot farther. Um, right, right, right. When, you, when you email this question or you email this statement saying we have an expressed interest, get rid of everything out of your email. Don't have all this stuff. Don't have links to the Better Business Bureau and, and pictures of your children. Nothing. You don't need any of that. All you need is your name, you know, and you can have a confidentiality. You don't even need that. You're dealing with the government. All right? Keep it simple. Don't, don't make for any reason for this thing to get blocked. Uh, you can go in here and... Under follow-up options, you can choose uh, request a delivery and request a read receipt. Something like that is fine, uh, but keep it simple. I mean, it, it, this is a common problem. I actually written an article about it on my LinkedIn. If you go down, you'll see a picture of some spam. Right here. People's emails get blocked by the government all the time. And the last thing you want to do is spend hours putting a bid together and then find out they didn't, never even got the email. 
Uh, and there's six ways to prevent that from happening or, or to make sure, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time to prevent it. You can't be 100% all the time. But read the article. It's a good one. And those are all on, I don't know if we got any new people on the system today. I actually went back in. I took all my media and put it in one place. For any of you guys interested in, in reading all my media or watching all my videos, you can actually go here. It's got every video, every article, everything that mentions my name is on this list. How about a top 20 list, though? Because, you know, there's a whole lot there. A top 20 is the best thing to do if you want that is just go to my YouTube channel because you can watch them by number of views. Okay. All right. you know, there's only 35 videos on YouTube versus LinkedIn. There's almost 100. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So yeah, just email them. That's all we can do at this point. Usually in the synopsis, because it's a pre-solicitation, it's not out for bid yet, usually they'll tell us here in the synopsis, um, where'd it go? Right here. It'll say right here in the synopsis that they want you to respond by emailing your cap statement. Or just put yourself on the watch list or the interested vendors list or something like that to let them know that you're interested. But in this case, they didn't. So we, we can just put ourselves on those lists or we can email them and tell them we're an interested vendor. Uh, we could email them and ask them if, there's, uh, you know, if they want us to do anything to express that we're interested. But you want to be as little as least intrusive as possible. The last thing you want to do is call these guys too many times. Email them once. Give them a day or two to respond. Uh, sometimes they'll do what's called a Q and A, and uh, eventually they'll ask you if you have any questions, and you'll email your questions over, and they won't respond for two or three days, and you'll think, "Wow, what a jerk! This guy's not taking my calls or, or returning my emails. He had no plans to." Once he gets all the questions, he's going to answer them. He's going to post them on FBO as a Q and A, and then they're going to extend the due date. So it wasn't that he wasn't calling you back or emailing you back because he's a jerk. He was just waiting to get all the questions from all the, the contractors and then answer them all and then post them and then extend it. So, you know, don't call them. Don't call them three or four times. Email them once. Give them a couple of days to respond. If the bid's due today at 5 and they haven't responded to our email, then we don't have a choice but call them if we have to. But unless you absolutely have to, don't. Email them first. It's far less intrusive. What do you do if you're not interested at all? Do you just ignore the email or do you respond to the email? Exactly. Now, if you're not interested in an opportunity at all, just ignore it. Just ignore Okay. Yep. Any other questions on this one? No. Okay. So you want to look at the next one you sent? Yeah. There's, the one I'm looking at here is, uh, looks like um, enclosures of skylights opening and, and installation of a roof. Okay. Which is um, numbers RFQP. Oh, you got it. What what questions did you have on this one? I don't know. I don't know. Um, well, I don't know if I even had a question because it's really basically the same thing as the other one. I just not knowing what to do now because um, we've never done this before. Oh, this is a small job. Yeah. Okay, the first two things I notice, uh, response date's December 30th. It's a small business set aside, so we definitely qualify. First thing that pops out at me is that this is a Davis-Bacon Act will apply, which means you're going to have to pay prevailing wages or, or current wage rates uh, for this contract. Um, you can get the list right off of the WDAL website or 99% of the time if this is Davis-Bacon required or prevailing wage, they're going to include the wage list with the documentation. So it, there it is right there. There's your wage rates right there. And you have to pay your guys a minimum of whatever it says you have to pay them. So make sure you run your rates based on these rates, not your normal rates, so that when you submit your bid, your bid's accompanied by those rates and, and you're, not, you know, you're not submitting a bid that's too low because you're not paying them the minimum. That makes uh -huh. sense. Yeah, yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong. Any uh, job that's produced by taxpayer money isn't that prevailing wage? No, nope. No. Uh, I mean, a lot of times it is, but not always. Uh, there's, I haven't found any rule with the government yet that always applies to everything. 
there's some rules that are you know pretty general across the board. Like when I first started working here in 2009, uh, more than half the contracts that went out were by American. But it's that we don't have very many factories left here. We we don't manufacture much stuff here anymore. A lot of this stuff is manufactured overseas and it's assembled here, or it's upgraded here, or it's migrated and and then you know uh, value added here. But the original product wasn't actually manufactured. So in the last five years, I've seen from half the contracts being by American to I haven't seen a single one this entire year. Actually, no, that's wrong. I did see one the other day. Uh, one other question. In yes. the um, in the synopsis, why don't they want you to state whether you're a small business, uh, disadvantage, or, you know, hub zone woman, are they more likely to get a job over anybody else or is this or is this lowest confident better no if it's a small business set aside it's it's rarely about better rarely uh, you and you're gonna see that it actually says it in the synopsis and in the solicitation in you've got the instructions to offer that's the area where it tells you what they want you to submit with your bid how they want your your bid submitted the instructions to offer is usually the standard 52.212-1 which is the most common uh, and the 52.212-2 uh, instructions to offer is what's called the evaluation. They tell you how they're going to evaluate the solicitation. And in the evaluation phase, if it's a small business set aside, they almost always say that your solution is the most important factor. Your past performance, your experience is second, and your price is third. So on a small business set aside, it's re rarely ever about who's the cheapest. It's about who has yeah. the best solution. I got Go ahead. I'm sorry. Did you have a have a question? No, nope, I'm. I was all set. Oh, okay. So on this one, we're looking for two things. We're looking for the statement of work or the performance work statement that tells us exactly what it is they want to buy, and that's right here, statement of work. And then we're looking for the instructions to offer instructions to offer is the detailed description of how they want us to submit our bid. That's probably attached to the RFQ link right here if I had to guess. So we're going to click on it, wait for it to download and open. This is what's called a standard form. I can see it's 20 pages. I can almost guarantee you the instructions to offer is on this form. So we're going to scroll down. Here's our table of contents. Okay. This is where they want you to fill out your pricing. When you see well, one dot, go ahead. Said, well, in the description zero 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 one, item one, is a design engineer. I mean, does it have to be a, you know, an engineer? Does it have to be a documented engineer, stamped, uh, et cetera, et cetera? Well, they're not telling us from here whether that's the case. So we would have to go to the statement of work to find out exactly what they mean uh, by design, engineer, and install. Um, okay. Engineer in this case doesn't mean they need you to have an engineer on site, but you would have to work with an engineer to design it and install it. Okay. All right. I got you. All right. Yeah. And you're going to see where they do these quantities go into the hundred thousands of quantities. This means one. That's all it means. I don't know why they add the thousands. Uh, people don't submit quote bids in, in tens of thousands anymore. Only the gas stations still do that. Okay, so this is telling you what kind of workman's comp and, and liability insurance you got to have. Etc. Okay, this is all reps and certs. It says 52.212.204.222.225. This is all stuff that we process for you. Instead of having to read all this, all you're going to have to do is download your reps and certs and send them a copy of it. So what we're looking for on this sheet do a control F looking for the word instructions.
Now we're looking for instructions to offer. It's not in here. We're going to go back to the index. I don't see it. No, nah, it's not on here. Um, usually is. Just goes to show you I'm not always right. Maybe it's on the statement of work. They're not giving us much here to work with. What about on a DOL? Or is that just a standard? Uh... This is the Department of Labor uh, agreement. It's only two pages. And this is the wage rate schedule, which it's rarely on. It could be on here. It's not, not very often, but. <laughs> Excuse me. Yep. Yeah, that's just the wage rates. So there's no instructions to offer on this. Um, they're not telling us how they want us to submit our bid, what they want us to submit with the bid. So we're going to go back to the synopsis, make sure we didn't miss it here. It's required to take to be submitted with the pricing and is expected to be evaluated at the lowest price technical acceptance. Hmm, no. Not giving us much here. And something like this, because I can ask the question, you know, good cop, bad cop, I can be the bad cop here. I'm just going to email them and ask them if there's going to be an instructions to offer or post it soon, see if we can get a response from her. All right. I'm going to pull the subject line back out, paste it, and see if there's any spelling errors in it. Okay. And there's not. I 
And yes, I always respond or communicate with purchasing agents by their first name. Get rid of all the links. And say, say thanks at the end, right? Exactly. Yeah, I found that more purchasing agents prefer not to be called Mr. and Mrs. than back in the day when we were, you know, we were taught you, you, you call me by my formal name. These days, they don't want to be called by their formal name. They just want to be called by their first name. So I found it's more uh, beneficial. And that's it. I'm just going to send the question and see if we can find out where we can get a copy of it. If not, for now, put it on your watch list. Add yourself to the interest of vendors list. That's all we could do. Now, you notice. You didn't spell offer wrong. I don't know if you saw that. Yeah. <laughs> You'll notice that uh, the interested vendors list link is here, but there's no interested vendors list up here, is there? No. This Why is a blind it? list. This is a blind list. The purchasing agent has not made it a public list. So you can oh. add yourself to this list and not worry about people marketing or calling you to sell you stuff because it's a blind list. No one will see it except the purchasing agent. Gotcha. All right. Now, sometimes upon an award, the purchasing agent will just tell you who it was awarded to and for how much. Sometimes they'll tell you all the bidders and how much each person bid. Uh, sometimes they give you a ton of information. Sometimes they don't. So it's it's yeah. either hit or miss. I I found that it's, I think it boils just down to people in general. I call it the 50-50 rule. Half the people on this planet have a good grasp of things. They understand it takes all of us together as a team to make this work. Um, you know, they, they they communicate well. They, they just got a good grasp of things. The other half of the people on the planet are self-centered, pretentious. The, the universe revolves around them, uh, you know. And, and I'm just saying, and you know, it's probably not 50/50. It's probably 80/20. But if you just think about that in general, when you're dealing with federal purchasing agents, you're going to get some that communicate, and they're they're great, and they're nice, and and you're going to get some that don't communicate at all, and they're grumpy, and you know, you, you'll see after working with a few of them, it's either one end of the spectrum or the other. Yeah. Any other questions on this? Uh, how are you, Mike? Thank you. No problem. Anybody else have any other questions or proposal solicitation they want to work on? Uh, no, I don't believe so. I'm going to uh, send you the email about my searching, searching myself and getting set up, finding a little bit of work. But other than that, you got it. I'm, uh, I seem pretty comfortable with it, and I got to get all my other reports set up and elevate a pitch and all that stuff. <clears throat> Sounds good. Send me a copy of that stuff as you complete it. All right. Not a problem, John. Thank you very much. No problem. John, I have a quick question. Yes. Um, is FBO the best database to use um, when searching for personal services contracts? For now, yes. Okay. Uh, we've got a database out called AFPDS, and it's mm -hmm. far better than FBO. With with the limits that FBO has, it's it's better than FBO just as it is. But we're also coming up with a new uh, portion of it that will not only show you the opportunity and give you updates every 15 minutes and and all that fun stuff, but it also, uh, you can click on the link and it'll tell you who did the contract last year and how much they were paid. So it searches the history of that contract and gives you the details about the history, which is really important. I mean, obviously it's good to know how much they paid last year before you submit your bid this year, because you want your bid to be, um, you know, you want, you, you want your bid to be um, fair, but believe it or not, more people lose federal contracts from underbidding than they do overbidding. Uh, I see contracts lost all the time because their price was too cheap. And here's the reason. Number one, again, the 50-50 rule, you're dealing with people that aren't spending their, their own money. So half of them really don't care whether they get the cheapest price or not. They're going to take the path of least resistance. They're going to hire whoever does the, the follows the instructions and makes their life easiest. So just because your price is cheapest and you were the best fit, doesn't mean they're going to hire you if you didn't make it easy on them. And it's based on good solution, right? Huh? And it's based on, yeah, if you got the right solution, what they, they really more, more contracts are lost because people don't follow the instructions. But when it comes to losing because of uh, price, it's more often because your price is too low than too high. 
Uh, purchasing agents also follow the mean, median, mode rule. Let's say a purchasing agent has to get a minimum of three bids, and they get five bids. Well, right off the bat, they're going to look for an excuse to throw two of those bids out because that's less paperwork they have to do. If they can find a way to show that those bids were not proper, they didn't follow the instructions, they had mathematical or, or grammatical errors, uh, they were handwritten, um, any number of things. You forgot to sign it. They're looking for excuses to throw those extra two out because they only needed three. All right, so that's number one. Number two, um, they'll check the math. A lot of purchasing agents will check the math first. And if your math doesn't add up, I don't care how much it is. I worked on a contract with a client uh, for a nuclear power plant. We're talking billions of dollars, uh, this contract. And they lost it because they had a mathematical error that was less than a dollar. Um, wow. I worked, I worked with a client on a contract, another scenario where it was a big job. And they hired a proposal writer. They didn't know I did proposal writing services, so they hired one. And this guy forgot to include the bid bond. And when they submitted the bid, a uh, purchasing agent came back and said, you were our first choice. But we had it. Well, he didn't tell him he was the worst first choice at first. Uh, he awarded it to somebody else. And I showed the client how to do a, a bid protest, not a bid protest, a debriefing. And they did a debriefing to find out why the agency chose who they did. And the purchasing agent told them point blank, uh, I wanted to hire you. You were our best choice. But you made a very amateur mistake. You forgot to include the bid bond with your bid. And we couldn't hire you. And it was no time to ask you to do it. It was, you know, blah, blah, blah. So they lost the contract because they made a simple mistake. If a purchasing agent's using the mean, median, mode system, and they've only got to get five bidders, and they get five bids, and the other four are right around the same price at $200,000, but yours came in at one fifty. They're going to throw yours out because it, it doesn't fit in the in the scheme. It doesn't make sense that yours is so so much less, but all the other guys are right around the same amount. So it doesn't pay to be the cheapest all the time because that's not always what they're looking for. Knowing what they paid last year, how much for that project before you submit it, especially if it's something like landscaping or janitorial, which doesn't change much each year, you're just adding on more money to cost for cover the cost of inflation. Um, your pricing should be roughly around what they paid last year. If it's way below that, they're not going to hire you because they think that maybe you missed something or you didn't do your bid properly. And you also don't want to be extremely high on the other end of the spectrum either. So your answer, your question was, is FBO the best? Yes, for now it is. Once the AFPDS has the new system in it that shows you the history, it will be far, far better than any database on the planet. And that database right now only tracks FBO. But the goal is to eventually have that database track all state and local government opportunities, eventually oh, wow. uh, track, track all Fortune 500s, eventually track all, uh, all government contractors, and eventually track all residential and commercial opportunities. So the database eventually will track every opportunity on this planet for bid, and that will be the only database you'll ever have to use. But that's going to take years to get it there. Mm -hmm. That's great. All right. Any other questions? I had a quick question about, back to pr about pricing. Yes. Um, I've seen on some solicitations where there's like a threshold of what they're willing, what the government's willing to pay for that specific project, um, and then I'll see it awarded, and it's less than that threshold. Um, could you explain that? You'll see a uh, you'll see an opportunity that says there's a threshold on it, and then it's awarded, and it's lower than the threshold. Yes, it, it can happen. Um, you know, and thresholds thresholds a lot of times are are just suggestions. I mean, I see thresholds where they say this contract's going to be anywhere between five thousand and fifty million. Come on, that's not oh. a threshold. You know, okay. there's no way if it's if it could be up to fifty million that it would ever be anywhere close to five thousand. They're just covering their rears when they do that, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'm not using them. I don't want them. Any other questions? Anybody else have a bid they want to work on today? 